Jones. If you want a boyfriend, then shave your arm hair off, you disgusting hairy Sasquatches. This was what some people interpreted famous Viner Nash Greer as saying after himself and fellow creators Cameron Dallas and JC Kalen made a video talking about how girls can be more attractive to guys. It was around Christmas time of 2013 when this dropped. This video is going on a decade since it's been released, and in the past decade, you could make the argument that this sort of video would now not be scoured at nearly as much as it was back then. There have been literally thousands of videos created in the past decade on the topic of what guys find attractive in girls or what girls find attractive in guys. Every time I open up my TikTok, without fail, there'll be some e-girl waiting to tell me her favourite thing about guys. It's all over the place. If we take things back a decade, these sorts of videos really weren't that popular yet. Greer's video though would become one of the first mainstream ones, but it was met with some severe backlash. The video in question, titled What Guys Look For In Girls, started off with the three boys talking about personality and what traits they find attractive, before eventually turning onto the dreaded topic of looks. With the clips I'm about to show you being just a small snippet of the things they said. Oh, that's about my biggest pet peeves when girls draw in their eyebrows. Don't draw in your eyebrows. Crayons, baby. Like, like brown. Your natural eyebrows look way better than a freaking marker. I don't like when girls have like all the stuff on their list, especially for dating, because then when you're like trying to kiss. I don't like lipstick, dude. I don't like lipstick, to be honest. Oh, too much lipstick. No, no, when, when they have that, like weird colors, like like red, brown, like a that black, black lipstick shit. Wait, yo, no, hygiene, all shave, like, like, brush style. your teeth, oh, arm shave. shave. Shame. This stuff when you have a little peach fuzz and we're, like we're making out. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, not even no. making out when the lights just like shining on. I can her see arm like, hair just hair. wax like, shade. Yeah, that's, that's the worst when there's hair. It's terrible. <laughs> no, no doubt. No, no, no. But the natural look though. The natural look is great, but <laughs> the, light, the <laughs> hair take the hair off. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't really care too much. Uh, like, yeah, I'm not a hair guy. Obviously, I showed you just a few of their more controversial comments. The video was almost 10 minutes long, so not every suggestion was met with as much backlash, but the overall message of the video was received very poorly. When watching a video such as this, or a video about what blank looks for in blank, you need to ask yourself who else is likely going to be watching, and the answer is probably teenagers. We're talking low confidence, highly suggestible, very curious teenagers. At the end of the day, there's no book you can read on what makes a good boyfriend or girlfriend without you looking like a massive neek. And so for the past decade or so, teenagers who want to figure out how to impress their crushes or how to get a boyfriend or girlfriend and want to know what guys or girls look for have stumbled across these sorts of videos. A 41 year old mother and wife is probably not going to watch this. A 14 year old, however, might. And what you'll see are mixed messages. Be natural, oh, of course, be natural, but also shave off your arm hair. At one point, Cameron Dallas says a girl playing video games is attractive, but being better than him is unattractive, even though he doesn't play video games. A girl that's good at video games? That too. That's pretty good. But not a girl that's obsessed with video games, yeah, not too much. Like, yeah, you, awesome. you yeah. can't be better than me, or else, yeah, I mean, I don't even play video problems. games. And you can't be better than me. These are mixed messages, and many people would argue that they're not exactly helpful. Creators such as Hank Green and Lamar Wilson would voice their opinions, saying that because these guys are young, they were aged between 16 and 18 after all, they probably didn't have the foresight to see that this could be potentially problematic to young girls who were the most likely demographic to see it. Hank would even go as far as to say that this video was abusive. Tumblr in particular raved in anger about this video over the Christmas period as users began to discover the origins of this YouTube subgenre, with creators such as Connor Franta having made a similar video that had almost 3 million views. Not only that, but the controversial Viner would see his YouTube channel grow from just under 350,000 subscribers before Christmas to almost 450,000 a week later, an increase of 100,000 subscribers in 7 days. Worse yet, this was only his fourth video, so he was immediately in hot water. His channel had barely spawned. That said, though this video has since been deleted, it was undeniably a huge success. Whether it be because boys liked what the trio had to say, or girls wanted to discover more about what boys liked, the controversy would have been more than worth it for the Viner, no doubt. This source of video definitely has a market, and it's been 100% normalised ever since, 
no doubt about it. So what do you guys think? Do you think that this could be harmful for young people in that it shames them, or do you think that this sort of video could be seen as useful advice with no punches pulled? Let me know what you think down in the comments below, because that's just one of the many stories I have for you today as we throw things back to the early 2010s. Some younger viewers watching might not be able to remember this app, but long before TikTok, even before its predecessor Musical.ly, came Vine. An app where users could upload videos limited to 7 seconds. In my opinion, this was the very first short form app as we know them today, laying the path for what was yet to come. Many people might be watching this video as a source of nostalgia, a throwback to hear names that they heard daily back a decade ago, but let me tell you right now, if you're looking for a light-hearted walk down memory lane, you won't find it here. So what kind of controversies can come from a mere 7 second clip? Well, you might want to ask Nash Greer, because he is actually infamous for two scandals, the second of which it's time to talk about. Born in 1997, Nash Greer was a teenager when he rose to infamy on Vine, beginning to post videos in 2013 and spending no time getting into controversy. He started posting videos right as the app debuted. For scale, it released in January 2013, and by April 2013, he would create a Vine that would later get him in a lot of trouble, with him using the F slur in response to a PSA of men saying that HIV isn't a gay thing. Testing for HIV. Now, this annoyed people for two main reasons. The first being, yeah, he shouted out a particular word for a British cigarette. Do keep in mind that this was back in 2013, and the word wasn't as stigmatised as it is today, but even back then, people knew the context. Of course, Nash definitely knew the context, as he used the word in reference to an argument that HIV isn't a gay thing, which it isn't exactly. Statistically, LGBT men are proportionally the most likely demographic to be HIV positive. However, according to the Terence Higgins Trust, in the year 2020, gay and bisexual men only made up a little under half of new HIV cases. Again, proportionally that is more when you compare the number of LGBT men compared to heterosexual men, but it wasn't a plurality. To many, this was Nash Greer showing his true colours. Even if it was meant to be a joke, many found it to be in poor taste. The 15 year old took down the vine before it received too much backlash, but its resurfacing was only a matter of time. As in July 2014, the video would return to our screens, prompting anger from various members of the LGBT community, such as Tyler Oakley, who commented on the situation. He tweeted out that this was false information. The internet then pulled the thread on this swearing sweater and watched it unravel, as it was later discovered that Nash spoke about British cigarettes quite a lot, especially on Twitter. He had a number of tweets that used the word very liberally. He would also use the words gay and queer as an insult quite a bit too, leading many people to brand him as a homophobe. In response, Greer would tweet out an apology, stating that he was young, ignorant and in a bad place, and that he had nothing against anyone or anything that promotes equality. It seemed rushed, insincere, and that's without mentioning the fact that it was only a year ago, so the young and stupid argument kind of fell flat. It's safe to say that people were not impressed by this apology, nor were people impressed by the relationship displayed by Cohen Owen, who back a decade ago infamously vined a breakup with his girlfriend. It was in the summer of 2013 when the then teenage Koa Nguyen and his girlfriend of three months were destined to break up. Lucky for us, as you might expect because this story is in this video, and because I told you just before, he actually decided to vine his breakup. But strangely enough, that wasn't even the weirdest part of it, as you'll soon find out. You liked her f***ing picture on Instagram. You follow her on Instagram. Are you f***ing vining? So yeah, it's all a bit abrupt. Vine is only six seconds after all, but what you have here is Koa, for some reason, recording their breakup and showing to the world the reason for their separation. Apparently, he liked another girl's Instagram post and followed her. Context might matter here. What kind of picture was he liking? Did he have a history of cheating and all that? I don't know about you, but to me, liking pictures from people of the sex you're attracted to isn't cheating. Perhaps you think it's a form of micro-cheating, and that's fair enough, 
but to others, her having a go at him for this would seem like a red flag. If you thought that though, what would happen next would raise about a dozen more, because on discovery that he was vining this breakup, her first instinct was to physically lay her hands on him. Assuming that this video was real and this wasn't a setup, it's really not a good look for her. Jealousy has overtly reared its ugly head, and this would be seen by the whole world. Koa would upload the Vine to his account, captioned, You guys just witnessed my breakup, hashtag damn. And from there, the story would be covered by various news outlets. To this very day, it's one of the most notable things about him on his famous birthdays page. Koa would also link the clip on the r slash video subreddit, where it would garner 1.9 thousand upvotes, and reportedly actually made the front page of Reddit not long after. Koa would make other vines during the platform's lifespan, but none as infamous as his breakup. Now 30 years old, despite having a fair number of followers on both Twitter and Instagram, Koa would take somewhat of a backseat from social media, posting a photo up onto Instagram back in 2016, captioned that he was done making videos, and having gone silent since June of this year. But from an infamous Vine to a person infamous because of the Vines created about her, Donna Godot is the next person we'll be talking about. Prepare for a mixture of comedy and horror, because her tale is as laughable as it is chilling. To understand Donna's story, we have to rewind the clock 12 years back to 2011, because that's when she's said to have committed a heinous crime. This is the Driftwood Inn in Port Arthur, Texas, where a 73-year-old man from Kansas named Juan Sustiata was staying. On Thursday the 1st of September 2011, Donna Godot, along with two other men, Kieron Elmore and Jeremy Godot, were reportedly on the hunt to find someone to rob. According to sources, they went knocking door to door at the Driftwood Inn, until someone finally answered. That someone, of course, was Juan Sustiata. As he opened the door, the criminals forced it open and went on to ransack the room. Eventually, they were able to get their hands on the man's debit card and demanded him to tell them his pin. Upon Sustiata's refusal, they reportedly tortured the 73-year-old, stabbing him in the process until he eventually gave them the number. The story goes that they then took his money from an ATM and left him for dead. All was not lost for Sustiata, however, as he would survive the ordeal and the police would later track down the trio and arrest them. What happened next, though, would send the internet through shockwaves, as three years later, the clip from KBTV, which interviewed the suspects, would go viral. Particularly the portion in which Donna speaks about her involvement in the crime. While the other members of her criminal crew would keep quiet about what they did, the same couldn't be said for Donna, whose contrast to her fellow suspects was very evident. Did y'all stab the victim? Did you do it? Who stabbed? The gentleman, was it you? You're being accused of something serious. You don't have anything to say in your defense? I just said I ain't got nothing to tell y'all, huh? What do you think of what you're being accused Man, of? I don't know. Huh? Hey, so tell us your Who's side. What happened? Hey, I'm an innocent bystander. They saying I drove a getaway car, but I cannot see. I'm legally blind. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I'm innocent. Come on this way. This informal interview with the press would go viral, with Donna giving several sound bites within only a few minutes that would blow up on Vine. I'm innocent. I ain't no robbing type of person. I wouldn't do nothing to no innocent man. I've been robbed. I've been pistol whipped. They got that on file. I'm innocent. I ain't do nothing. I don't know what's going on. All I know is my side of the story. I can't tell no other story. I'm innocent. And... Mama, I love you. P.O.P. All the day. Pray these all good people spoil baby for life. Hey, I'm not no robber type of person. I'm who I am. You know what I'm saying? I ain't no robber type of person. That's it. That's all. Hey, I ain't going nowhere. I'm still going to be right back in the streets. You did, because I'm innocent. I don't care what nobody got to say. Hey, free. Free down the good old baby. Pimp squad is going down. P.O.P. I thought your name it's was going in down. Good I thought your name was in good old. My name is good old. I'm not no good old. But they're not related to you? Nah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that good old dude. I don't know who he is. Oh, so you're a good old, but not related <laughs> yeah. to that good old. I don't know what they done. I don't give a f 
what they done, you know what I'm saying? My sympathy go out to the man, Thank you. whatever. My sympathy goes hey, out. Donna, we're gonna get moving, okay? So you wanna get moving? All right, Donna, all right, all right. No, I'm white, I love you. That's my mama. Holy die, Breonna Good I, I love you. We need, we need to Free Donna the Good I'm coming out. I'll be out. Bye bye. Now, from a legal standpoint, I really don't know how well this did to help her case. She frequently contradicts herself, and her story holds up just about as well as a bridesmaid at a bachelorette party after her seventh shot of tequila. But to this very day, people still leave comments on the video saying to free Donna Godot, saying that she's innocent, that she did nothing wrong, and overall, reveling in this clip. Phrases such as pimp squad baby, I'm legally blind, and pop hold it down were particularly taken to by social media, and so with this being the early 2010s, soon after came the parodies which only further increased the virality of the original clip. This newfound fame however wouldn't be seen by Donna though, as the judge would bring the law down on Donna and her associates, giving one of them, K. Ron Elmore, 60 years, Jeremy Godot, who's thought to be related to Donna, 50 years behind bars, and Donna herself, the lightest sentence, 18 years. For many people, this was where the story ended, but not for you. Because upon doing my research into this woman, I was able to find a six part video series called The Pimp Squad Chronicles by Kenny Webster, in which he interviews Donna. The series first episode released on the 15th of September 2015, more than four years after the crime initially took place. And within the first few seconds, it was clear to witness that Donna hadn't changed much since her interview, still exuding the same charisma as she had back then. Who is Donna Goodo? Right here. Donna Goodo, aka Miss Dollar Bill. Who, well, who are you? Who is Donna Goodo? I'm Donna Goodo. I'm from Port Arthur, Texas. I was an upcoming rapper during my rap career. I have a daughter that I love. Shout out to Brianna Nicole Goodo, aka Munchie. Mama, I love you. P.O.P. Holy Dying. Ain't nothing changed. Pimp squad for life, baby. Despite the fact that she was complicit in a horrendous crime, the comments seem sympathetic towards her. Flash forward to the modern day, and despite multiple death rumours, according to various online sources, Donna Godot is still alive and well, now 12 into her 18 year sentence. Provided that nothing changes, she's scheduled to be released from prison in 2029. So we've spoken about a fair few infamous Viners in this video already, but I don't think it would be complete without discussing perhaps the most famous of them all. Loved by some, despised by others, it's Jay Sizzle himself, Jacob Sartorius. So Jacob Sartorius was born on the 2nd of October 2002, and after having a fairly typical, albeit a bit of a sad childhood, he rose to substantial fame in the mid 2010s, with Vine in particular having a huge part to play in this boy's success. It was in 2014 that he began uploading to the now defunct platform when the boy was 11 years old. Within only two years, his was a name that was tough to avoid on the internet, with the teenager releasing songs Hit or Miss and Sweatshirt, which now have 130 million views on YouTube combined. However, his rise to fame was also met with a lot of backlash too. If you can remember back to this time on the internet, to many people he was like Marmite. You either love it, or you hate it. In the loving camp, the biggest portion of his fans, it has to be said, were probably girls around his age that had a crush on him. Based on how he seemed to be presented in his music videos, it appeared as though he was being primed to be the next Justin Bieber or One Direction, two of the biggest music acts in recent memory. The problem that a platform like Vine had though, was that it's very hard to get personality across in six seconds. This was one of the main reasons why many Viners couldn't revive their careers after the platform shut down. Because what of any substance can you get across in six seconds? This of course was perhaps a good thing for Jacob because it meant that he was able to gain a lot of followers, but it did have its downsides. Mainly that being that if you weren't a fan of his, you'd see this boy as a fraud. Surprisingly pretty well described by one of his haters. I hate Jacob Sartorius. He sucks, okay? He only got famous for making vines and musically. He doesn't deserve to be famous. He's just a freaking kid, okay? He is nothing. He's nothing but a facade. 
an appearance, a show up, a model for made for little eight year old girls. That's all he does. And his hair looks like tumbleweed. It looks like somebody took a shit on his head. Okay? Jacob Sartorius, I declare war. You're going down. To summarize, his haters either saw him as A, making unfunny vines, again the 6 seconds did not help him outside the platform, and many people thought that he was just plain talentless, or B, they thought that he was a manufactured attempt at being the next Justin Bieber, as this kid said. He is nothing, he's nothing but a facade, an appearance, a show up, a model for, made for little 8 year old girls. His critics thought that he was a corporate, contrived shell of a human being who's wearing what he's been told, saying what he's been told, and who's releasing music that's been written, produced, and marketed for him. Jacob's first major songs came out in 2016, and if we look at what was happening in the music world and popular culture back then, it paints an unfortunate picture for Jacob of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. If we take a look back to recent musicians that made teen pop, Big Time Rush decided to call it quits in 2013. Justin Bieber, though always famous, was probably at his peak in popularity back when he made this sort of music back in 2010 to 2012, coming out with his album Purpose back in 2015, which was a notable shift from My World and Believe in that it showed a lot more maturity than the previous two. One Direction, on the other hand, had band member Zayn leave the group in March 2015, and though still undeniably popular, with their album Made in the AM selling 2.4 million copies, this wouldn't hold a candle to their 2013 release Midnight Memories, which sold 4 million copies. In truth, teen pop, in the way that we knew it, was dying. In the past decade, I think it's fair to say that the genre has shifted. Corporate produced teen pop stars are fewer and further between. Instead, with the rise of TikTok especially, they've given way for more authentic bedroom artists. Jacob Sartorius in no way began as a corporate produced artist, don't get me wrong, at the end of the day, he began as an 11 year old making stupid 7 second videos. And without trying to sound cruel, I'm sure that modern day Jacob would look back at sweatshirts and hit or miss, and admit to himself that there was definitely room for improvement. At no point would the mainstream audience see anything in here and think yes, this was Jacob's idea and creative vision. Not the lyrics, not the concept for the music videos, nothing. And this is despite the fact that Jacob Sartorius at the time was under the T3 record label, which is not part of the big three record labels, Sony, Universal or Warner. Unfortunately, it was just the wrong type of music at the wrong time. Once more, this wasn't helped by the cheesy music videos, mediocre vocals, or plain awful lyrics and out of touch attitude. Waiter with my cock, who doesn't care about my health, like you do, baby, oh, I'm saying this. Me and my managers are in LA, we go eat food every day, and I'm so used to the same thing where like the waiter's like, okay, what can I get you? They're not happy with their job, They're, I mean, it's a job, and you know, like, people gotta work, but at the same time, like, you should be happy with what you do. Maybe the record label just wanted these videos to appear like they were produced by a big studio, I don't know. But the mid-2010s was definitely a transitional time in the music industry, and boy bands and teen pop artists would soon fade into the background. In truth, talking about Jacob Sartorius today it seems a bit redundant. Though he's still undeniably famous, it's fair to argue that he's not as culturally relevant as he was the better part of a decade ago, and it's easy to forget that he was incredibly famous, or perhaps infamous, depending on your opinion of him all those years ago, and he's definitely a viner that deserves a spot in this video. And the themes of his story follow on well to who we're talking about next. It's time to dig deeper into why many Viners struggled to break into the mainstream with one of the most shocking cases, the Dapper Laughs Backlash. So Dapper Laughs is known as a content creator and comedian on his Wikipedia page, with all of his controversies coming after the year 2014. That's because the now 39 year old was said to be discovered on Vine. And it's safe to say that Dapper Laughs, real name Daniel O'Reilly, did very well for himself on the app. He did so well in fact that in September 2014 he even got his own show on ITV2, a second channel owned by one of the largest TV networks in the UK. His show, Dapper Laughs on the Pool, would go down just about as well as a plane with no wings. 
The reviews, put simply, were awful. Its one and only user review on IMDb described it as a mistake of a program, and the reviews from British papers were not good. So we need to look into its quality, or lack thereof, and uncover why. In hindsight, it might be easy to see, but there is absolutely nothing about being funny for six seconds at a time that would qualify you for a six episode spot on TV. Of course, at the time, television studios didn't know that. From their perspective, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people wanted to see more of this person, it made sense to milk it. The mid-2010s was often a rough time for creator-based projects because they were lured into making TV shows and movies, essentially all of which both critically and commercially bombed. KSI and Casper Lee's Laid in America, The Smosh Movie, The Fred Trilogy, Shane Dawson's Not Cool, each of these movies were all made within a few years of each other and they just didn't reach the marks that they were meant to. And the stars of these movies were YouTubers whose videos often had to be entertaining for at least 8 minutes, let alone 6 seconds. Dapper Laughs was never on the same level of fame as KSI, Smosh, Fred, or Shane Dawson. There's a slim chance I think that you would have heard of his show, but if you did, perhaps you'd know it because the show is said to be horrendously sexist. From what I gathered, Dapper Laughs is meant to be a mental pickup artist, and they'll pair him up with men who have had trouble getting out there and going on dates, and he will observe them as they go up to random strangers in the middle of broad daylight and make some moves. It's a real tough watch for me, because as you might expect, it just comes off as awkward. Grace Dent of The Independent described it as unpleasant sexism dressed up as banter. A few critics take on the show was that it was so sexist, some people could even interpret it as some sort of a guide to, or the incitement of rape. Make a girl laugh, you make her moist. I was going to tell you a joke about me cock, but it's too long. <laughs> like that, did you get your gash out then? If she's looking at me and playing with her hair, by the end of the night she'll need a wheelchair. But how do you know if she's interested? It's easy, there's one thing you've got to do. Just show her your penis. If she cries, she's just playing hard to get. And this is where the story would take a huge turn, as Dapper would joke about the accusation at a comedy gig, making light of it. It's a rapist go-to guy, my TV shows up. I've, I've filmed six episodes. Half hour each episodes, right? If it was a f***ing guy to f***, I would have done one five minute episode. I would come with a gun, hey, yeah, I'll have a last. Go down the shop, get some rope, bit of duct tape, break the f***ing well done, see you later. <laughs> you can't f*** women. This is where it all fell apart. When this came out, it was the beginning of the end for Dapper Laughs. More than 60,000 people signed a petition to get him off ITV, the comedian's future gigs were cancelled, and as would be season 2 of the show. Would it have been greenlit for a second season otherwise? Potentially not, but it was undoubtedly cheap to make, so you never know. Nevertheless, this was the final nail in the coffin. Obviously, this clip was taken at a comedy gig, and it was meant to be a joke. It's a comedian's job to find the line and to push boundaries, and sometimes that will upset and offend people, but to many viewers at ITV, this was far over the line. In a time where big studios were looking towards creators as a new potential avenue to connect with a wider audience, O'Reilly definitely didn't represent them well. He later came out to apologise on BBC Newsnight, where he said that he got carried away, and that Dapper Laughs was a character, and shouldn't have been taken seriously by any means. Um, from the beginning that I started um, with the character Dapper Laughs, um, it caught on really quick that that type of humour was really popular for, for a certain demographic of people. It, like the, the Facebook page blew up, and at the time I didn't think that so many people would end up seeing it in the end. It became very popular and um, I kind of got a little bit carried away with it, to be honest with you. In the end, the Dapper Laughs character was discontinued, but flash forward to only a few weeks ago and Daniel O'Reilly would make a small comeback in the creator boxing scene, absolutely annihilating creator Simple Simon within a minute. What's next for Dapper Laughs? We'll have to wait and see. But at least it seems as though over the past few years, he's improved his punchlines. Now in truth, I think there's a lot more to say about Vine as a platform and the rise and fall of Vine creators. It's a topic that I'd really like to discuss further, but only if there's a demand for it. So like the video, subscribe if you haven't yet. If this video performs well, then I will make a part two. 
If you're not convinced yet, maybe another video can help you make up your mind. Why not discover the insane stories behind infamous deleted TikToks? That one is another short form centric gem of a video, check it out if you haven't already, I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Aside from that, I want to thank you for watching and I'll see you later.